We've been going through Corinthians, and that's what we're going to continue doing today. We'll keep going through Corinthians until there's no more First Corinthians to go through. Then we'll go through Second Corinthians, because that's how numbers work. Uh, and then when that's done, then I don't know where we're going next. But that's what we currently are focused on. Now, Corinthians is written to the town of Corinth. And if you lived there, then you are a Corinthian. Uh, Corinth is kind of a nuts city. Uh, The Las Vegas of the Middle East, if you will. Uh, So lots of different gods, lots of weird debauchery, uh, sex parties, all kinds of crazy things going on. All of that's going on there. And in the midst of that, you have this church spring up because, you know, Jesus came, died and resurrected and then sent his followers into the world to tell other people that there was freedom from the bondage of sin if they would believe in him. So his followers did what he asked them to do, which caused all these churches to spring up in um, Gentile and pagan places. Uh, all that then, Paul gets uh, straddled with trying to help them navigate what does it mean and what's it look like to be a church of Jesus in a city that's really pagan and lost and broken. Uh, and so he has to deal with a, a bunch of different problems. So if you've been with us for the last few weeks, then you know we've dealt with all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, what it means to be Christian and single, what's it mean to be Christian in marriage, uh, a little bit on Christianity and sexuality. Uh, we've dealt with who's the most important apostle. We've dealt with pride. Uh, last week, we dealt with don't eat the food of idols. That was invigorating. Uh, if any of that seems exciting to you, you can find uh, those old messages if you missed them online. You can look us up on Facebook at Vintage uh, Church, or you can find us on YouTube if you search Pastor Pat Edrington. is probably the quickest way. Uh, not to toot my own horn, but if you want to find us, that's the way to do it on uh, YouTube. You can catch up on any messages you have missed. This week then, uh, we're going to continue right on running through it. Uh, we're going to cover a bunch of scripture today, so we're going to jump in maybe quicker than normal. What Paul is dealing with is now we've dealt with some of these issues where he feels like these are things we need to discuss, uh, and now we're going to get to this place where it seems like they're questioning the validity of Paul. Which is really funny when you put it in like the context of church history, that you go like, it's the Apostle Paul, like he wrote all of these books in the New Testament, uh, he is the Gentile missionary, he's this big influence on Christianity and all of these things. But what you see uh, when we start to jump into this and look at it is, it seems maybe that the church in Corinth is questioning whether or not they should even be listening to Paul. Uh, for various reasons that we'll get into this morning. So that's what chapter 9 is about. So we are going to jump into it. What we're going to look at then is what's a pastor's motivation? What's a pastor's place? Uh, should you pay pastors? Are all, all pastors care about is money. That age-old adage, uh, we hear that one all the time. I don't go to church because all they care about is my money. Uh, so we're going to cross that bridge. So buckle in. Uh, so All that to say then, Paul is going to address this, and Paul is going to do, I think, what you should do when people have complaint about you. Uh, So if you get something this morning, get this. Um, If somebody has an issue with you, the right response that Paul shows us then is to confront that person about that issue. Because we're family first, and it's not out of the question to think somebody would do something that irritates you or somebody would do something that would hurt your feelings. What is out of the question and is not acceptable inside of a Christian community is to not deal with it, to gossip about it, to talk about that person behind their back, to never confront it, never deal with it. The Bible's got all kinds of different places on how to approach when there is um, hurt or pain or something's happened that you disagree with. And this example we're going to have in chapter 9 is the perfect way for Paul to deal with it. He is going to answer the questions and explain this is why we do the things that we do. He starts like this, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If, hello, if to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So they're questioning whether or not Paul is an apostle. So just, just for background information so that you know why they're doing that, um, Paul is not one of the original 12 disciples. So if you, you, know, if you don't know Christianity or whatever, then Paul, Paul is a Jewish rabbi who is anti-Jesus, anti-Christianity, 
uh, is persecuting the church. He's there when they stone and kill Stephen in the book of Acts. He has this conversion experience on the road to Damascus when Jesus speaks to him uh, out of the heavens and says, Paul, it's me, Jesus. Why are you doing this thing to me? That's what he's talking about when he says, have I not seen the Lord? That's what he's getting at. I've had these experiences post my thing. Yes, I'm an apostle. But what seems to be going on is uh, this church in Corinth wants a better pastor, not from a spiritual place, not from a leadership place, not from an apostolic blessing place, but just from a clout place. They just want somebody that feels more important because of how important they think they are. It's entitlement. Like, I, like really, Paul, this is who we're going to, we couldn't get Matthew down here. We couldn't get Mark, one of the big boys that actually was there and saw all this stuff. That's what we're dealing with. And so Paul's like, no, we're not going to do all of that. Uh, I am free. I am an apostle. I did interact with Jesus. I do have grounds to do the things that I am doing. And then he goes on to say this. This is my defense to those who would examine me. That defense there is in the context of like a case of law. He says, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we have, not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say... For it's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. It is for oxen that God is concerned. Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we've sown spiritual things among you, it is too much if we reap material things from you. If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? Nevertheless, we've not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in their sacrificial offering? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. All pastors care about is money, right? We got, a, we got all of these bozos, for lack of a better term, running around out there, and they make all this money, and that's all pastors care about. Now, listen, I'm going to break in on something, and it may break your heart. There are people in Christianity who exploit their pastoral position to make a buck, and they take advantage of their churches, and they take advantage of their people. Here's the thing that you won't hear. Those people are outliers. That is not the norm in churches. Most pastors... Don't make huge amounts of money. Trust me. That's not what we do, and it's not where we live, and it's not who we are. Here at Vintage, here's how we do it. Every pastor makes the same thing. You get paid more if you've been here longer, but everybody makes the same. We do that because I've worked in churches where people who have a microphone and speak make exorbitant amounts of more money than the poor sap that's trying to put together the kids program, and I've done both and been a part of both, and guess who's doing more work? The poor sap putting together the kids program. So it doesn't seem fair to me that the guy that gets to speak and do something that he loves to do and would do anyway makes way more money than the poor kid that's trying to figure out how to make a kid's program run on a shoestring budget trying to piece together a bunch of stuff with all your children. Are we trying to imply that the guy that disciples children doesn't have as much value as the guy that disciples you? Because that doesn't seem biblical to me. So how we do it? Everybody makes the same. Pastors make $43,000, I think, right now here at Vintage. That's what we make a year. That's on the, if you want to know that, we'll tell you that. You want to know where our money goes? We'll tell you that too. You won't hear, ever hear us preach a message about offerings where we try to guilt trip you and make you give money. You're never going to hear me have a message where I stand up and say, if you don't give, God's going to send you to hell. You're never going to hear a message here at Vintage where I stand up and say, you got to give to be blessed. If you don't give, God won't give back to you. All of that's not biblical. Now, here is the truth about the text that we are looking at this morning. If you want your church to grow then you have to pay your pastors. Churches with paid staff do better than churches without paid staff. Vintage has been both. Bivocational for a lot of years. We've been paid for two years, 
all the previous years of vintage, we worked other jobs and did this because we felt like it's what God called us to do. What Paul is saying is that's how the whole world works. That's how everything is. If you have a job and you work in a factory, you have a 401k, you reap the benefit. If your company does well, you do well. In the same way, what Paul is saying is like, look, if I come to you, if I teach you, if I preach to you, if I disciple you, if I'm here for you for all the things that you need me to be here for, I do all of the pastoral duties that I'm going to do, then you should kick it back so that you have that person in your life. Now, here's the thing. Some of you have had terrible experiences with pastors, and we've got to be honest. That means that what? Pastors should be paid if pastors are <laughs> working. Right? Like you can't, you can't not do things. You can't not show up. You can't not be around. You can't not be a part. You can't hand everything off and then be like, and on top of that, I want an exorbitant salary because look how important and special I am. That's demigod behavior, and it's not what Paul's talking about. What Paul is saying is you should serve your people, and if you serve your people, then they should take care of you so you can serve your people. That's why when somebody says to me, I want to get married, Pastor Pat. How much is that going to cost me? I always say to them, I don't charge. And then people are like, you can't do marriages for free. Are you insane? If somebody gives me money, I'm not going to tell them no. But I'm also not going to give them a flat rate and say this is what it costs for me to be a pastor because I'm already paid to be a pastor. I'm not going to take extra money. That doesn't make any sense to me. The same is true when it comes to using the building for marriages. If you come, if you attend, if you're a part of what we do and you want to get married and you need a building, we have a building. I've never understood why people are like, well, we have the building, but to use the building, it's some arbitrary number we came up with. It's astronomical so that you can't actually afford to use the building. No, it's a church building. If it's your church and you want to get married in your church, I'm not going to be like, well, it's $19,000 to use the building because somebody has to turn the lights on and they have to pay them. That's insane. You give... You are a part, this is your church, and I facilitate and serve, Pastor Nathan facilitates and serve, so that you have this available to use it for what you need to use it for. That's how vintage works. That's why when some of you have been like, Pastor Pat, I would like to do a women's thing in the basement, do you care? No, I don't care. I'm not coming, because I'm not a woman. (laughs) Hope you don't get your feelings hurt, but no, get you a key and get you in, because that's how churches are supposed to work. So, at Vintage, what we got to do is when we jump into messages like this and you start thinking about what it is Paul is saying, you have to take all of the preconceived garbage that you walk into from bad experiences in churches, uh, from things that you've seen, things you've heard, I bet this is like this, I bet that is like that, and you got to put that all in a box and put that on a shelf in your brain and go, that was what I did experience, but that's not what I'm experiencing now. It's transparent here at Vintage. If you have questions about any of it, we'll tell you. Because it's your church, not my church. And I think it's interesting when Paul starts to preach and talk about it that there does seem to be a thing built into it that uh, there's a worry you could use it to manipulate people to make yourself wealthy. This is one of the arguments people say about why you shouldn't believe that the Bible is believable because obviously Paul made it all up and manipulated it so that he could have notoriety, power, and wealth. You know, a la Joseph Smith, uh, Muhammad, various other weird cults that have sprung up over the years that have manipulated and taken advantage of people to get things from them because people like the idea that if I give money to this person or I empower this person, they'll give me some secret spiritual knowledge that will be my salvation. The gospel is free. We're not going to charge you for it. We're not going to try to manipulate it. You're never going to hear from this stage that you got to give X amount of dollars to get it. Christ died so you could live, period. And if you never give a dime, you're still going to go to heaven because the cross is bigger than your cheapness. It's not in the Bible somewhere where it says, well, if you don't give, you don't get to go. It's not what it says. If you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. What you do with your money is between you and him, not between you and me. You're not ever going to see that here at church. We're not going to treat you different on what you give. I don't know what you give. People are like, how do you not know? Listen, I know what's in our bank account, obviously, but it's not like I'm pouring over who's given what and who's given where and like calling up the people who give more. Would you like to have a steak dinner on Pastor Pat's? We, we need a new computer in the back. Why don't you come on out? I'll tell you how pretty you are and how wonderful your wife is. Like, we're not doing all that. If God's blessed you and given to you, then you give to the church. That's what he calls you to do. And if you don't give, well, that's between you and him. 
Like it's not a thing where we, I feel like we have to manipulate or we have to force people or attack people or make people feel bad because it's not what the Bible says. That's not the motivation for being a pastor. Paul goes on, I've made no use of these rights, nor am I right in these things to secure any provision. I'd rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For I preach the gospel that gives me no grounds for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I pray and present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. Now it's interesting when you get into the study of this and look at it because when you first start reading through chapter 9, it feels like maybe Paul is dealing with people who are saying all Paul cares about is money. And so Paul's like, no, I, I work, I make tents, I'm bivocational, I don't need a dime for you. What matters to me is the gospel, that's not what I'm going to do. But when you get into the study of the city, it's probably the exact opposite. People are mad at Paul because Paul won't take the money. In Corinth, you had extremely wealthy people because it's a port city and you have all this excess money. And so money is used to wield power and to wield authority. If you come across somebody that you can't buy, then you lose that foothold. So Paul's not for sale because he doesn't need them because he works and provides for himself. What matters to Paul is the gospel for everybody. So these people are frustrated that they can't get what they want out of him because they're trying to give him money that he doesn't need. Which is kind (laughs) of how the world works today. We spend a lot of time talking about we got to love poor people, right? These poor, oh, these poor, poor people. We just got to love them and take, oh, look, look at the poor, poor people over there. They just making those bad choices. I guess, you know, the poor, poor people, we've got all of these programs and all these things in play. Oh, it's just so sad. The poor, 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 poor. We'll look at the poor people. Except there's way more attack on who in the Bible? Rich people. Nobody in poverty wants to be in poverty. That's not true, Pastor Pat. There's people out there taking advantage of the system. No, stupid. They're surviving. They're surviving. Nobody, I've ne- listen, I've worked with poverty a lot of years. I've never met anybody in poverty who's like, I like poverty. It is super fun. I like having to call you and figure out how I'm going to pay my power bill. I like wondering how I'm going to get formula for the baby. I like trying to figure out how we're going to feed everybody. I like trying to figure out, do I have enough money to have the heat on, or do I have enough money to have the water on? Like, I, it's fun. This is where I want to live. Nobody's doing that. But you know who I have met? A whole bunch of greedy rich people who don't want anybody to talk about their money, who get frustrated when you bring it up and get mad if you do any implication to say that because they have money, they shouldn't have any more right or say than somebody who doesn't. Well, I gave the money to this, so you need to listen to me. Keep your money. Take that money, ball it up real tight, put it back in your pocket, take it back home and worship it like you're still doing because you obviously don't understand what it is we're trying to accomplish here. It ain't your money. God allowed you to have that money. So you should thank God that that's how he's blessed you, and then you should use that blessing to bless others. There is a vast discrepancy and difference between the ultra-rich in this country and everybody else. But whenever anybody talks about uh, maybe we just should not be ultra-rich, everybody gets all uptight and upset. Well, how come? Because money is the root of American society and the root of power and the root of authority. And when anybody talks about your money, then people get frustrated. I don't go to church because all the pastor cares about is money. You worship money. Why does that matter? I don't go over there because they're always talking about, about my wife. Well, that makes sense. They're talking bad about your wife. But if somebody says to you, hey, do you really need all of this stuff that you had? Or can you give a little bit to somebody over here who doesn't have as much as you do? You lose your mind. Well, now, why don't they have? Well, why, why aren't they? Is there going to be a system in place? There's going to be a program? Somebody going to be in charge? There's going to be a committee that's going to make sure we're not getting taken advantage of? Listen to this mantra that's a vintage church that may annoy you. Listen, if I don't run you off today, I don't know when I will. Um, If you help poor people, you're going to get taken advantage of, period. And guess what? 
We're not going to begrudgingly approach it that way. Well, you know these poor people, they're just all, you got to be smart with them because they're always trying to manipulate you. Look, if they manipulate, they manipulate. That's fine because we're going to love and take care of them and bless them because God's blessed us. What they do is between them and God. So who are you to come along and be like, well, they're, they're always taking advantage. Like this, I've had people be like, well, Pastor Pat, you know, if we, if we give out food or something, we got to make sure that people aren't taking more food than they need. What's that look like? I'm so confused. Do you have somebody at Kroger doing that to you when you shop? You got somebody that's employed with Kroger following you around going like, do you really need four cans of SpaghettiOs? Like, we need to tone it down, sir. Well, Pastor Pat, this lady came in and she took six cans of corn. Okay. Well, what's she doing with all of it? Eating it, I would assume. Do you think there's a black market for corn? Like she set up shop somewhere and is hawking black market corn that she's taken from you and you're funding some criminal empire? Come up for air. But all of that's rooted in this idea that if I have money and if I have power, then you should do the thing that I want to do. And Paul shows us in Corinthians, I don't care about your money. So much so that Paul is willing to forego money he's owed because he's pastoring and teaching in the church so that those who have the money who are trying to control him, he can go, I didn't take a dime from you. You have no power or authority over me. My power and authority comes from Jesus. So I don't really care what you think, and I don't really care if you get mad. I don't really care if you don't show up, I don't, because I'm going to do what God's called me to do, which is the same way we approach it here at Vintage. So if I've hurt your feelings or if you're upset or if you're like, I'm gonna have a, we're going to have a stern talking, well, we can have the stern talking, but you're not going to change what I think because it's not my own personal ideology. It's Scripture. What you have is because God gave it to you. And you are as responsible for the person sitting next to you as you are for yourself. And so as a body of believers and as a family of Christ, we're going to come together and we're going to help, which is why you want a church, right? So when you guys give money, that's what we do with money. We pay power bills. We buy people groceries. We, we do the things that need done so that there's not that weird. Because here's the other thing about you people. God bless your pointed heads, but you guys will make a catastrophe out of stuff real quick without organization. Well, so-and-so said that the baby doesn't have any diapers, so I got on my own Facebook page. I made my own vintage me, and I posted that, and then I, I tagged everybody who goes to vintage, which you didn't, but you tagged who you know, but whatever. And then for so long, then we got this whole ministry going in the background that I don't even know who started it, who's running it, what's going on. How come we have 97 boxes? of diapers showing up at church, all because you guys are passionate about helping people who are poor. Whew! So because of that, we try to keep everything in-house, right, and run it through a system so there's an idea of what's going on, which is, again, then, why you pay pastors so that you have people that you can, instead of trying to figure out how to solve the problem yourself, you can call Vintage and go, hey, I know so-and-so's coming on Sunday, and they don't have water at home. I know so-and-so's coming, and they don't, they're free. They don't have the power to pay their power so that we can help people. Because here at Vintage, we don't worship money, we worship Jesus. Our motivation is not to get rich. Our motivation is not to accumulate. Our motivation is to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. Which is where Paul goes. He says, for though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jew, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Though I might win those outside the law, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak, and I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessing. Every year, September, the third Wednesday, for 12 years of my life, we did an event called Wired at the Edge. The Edge was the youth ministry I was a part of, and it was the most incredible chaos ever. We would push hard for six to eight weeks beforehand for kids to bring their friends. You would have services of 700 to 1,000 students show up. We would put in inflatables because we wanted to get sued. <laughs> you had laser tag and band battle offs and every stupid thing you could think of to try to put bodies in the building. And every year, I would deal with 
not unsafe people, not even people in church, in the church we were in. I would deal with local others who would go, you're not preaching the gospel over there. You're just trying to appeal to people so they'll come. But what you save them with is what they're saved to. And I would just laugh. First off, that you think I care about your opinion is hilarious to me. You're not showing up every week to deal with these heathen. You're not here day, week in, week out trying to figure out how to break up fights and how do we call the police so we've got cops here. You're not here holding hands trying to walk drug dealers and kids that are pregnant when they're 15 and trying to love them and encourage them and help them get their feet on solid ground. So I could really, you know, give a rip what you think. But it would break my heart a little that there seems to be this underlying idea inside of Christianity that you should not do things to appeal to people so that they want to come and be a part of what it is that you would do because if somehow you do that, you're watering down the gospel. Trunk or treat was like that this year. I had to put myself on Facebook timeout. That's what Pastor Pat does. I will scroll Facebook and see something, and then I will go delete the app until the season is over because I can't deal. So multiple Christian people this year type, we're just looking for a church that doesn't celebrate trunk or treat. It's the devil's holiday. Listen, occult stuff is real. The demonic is real. Opening your mind to that, engaging that is real. Let me tell you a little secret. There's not an occult ritual that involves dressing up like a unicorn and asking an older couple if you can have a baby Ruth. That doesn't exist. Now, what I don't understand and what I don't get is people have an aversion to church. We don't have to pretend church is off-putting to people who did not grow up in church or who were not a part of church, which means then as the church, if you're called to reach those people, you have to go, this is the audience that we are targeting. Now, you can go one of two ways, all right? You can stand up and you can preach a message and say, well, the world's evil and we hate the world and we're just going to cocoon and not deal with them. Or you can go, we have to figure out how to build inroads into a community so that we can carry the cross into that place. Which means then, trunk or treat is like the easiest thing to do. It's just like wired. This thing is an easy thing to do that puts a bunch of people on your property, a bunch of people around you, a bunch of contact, so that then you can have Jesus moments with people. Because here's the thing about wired that nobody ever talked about. Every year at wired, because you had all these kids show up and you did all that stupid stuff, whenever it came for time for service, you could preach as hard as you want. They weren't there for you. They didn't even know you were going to preach. They were like, I don't know, there's free candy down there and laser tag and basketball. There's inflatables. There's hot girls. There's hot boys. I'm going. Then you could get him into service and you could preach hard about Jesus Christ. You could preach there's an enemy of this world that's going to fight spiritually for your soul, and he wants you to die and be alone. He doesn't want you to know who you are. He wants you to be addicted to whatever thing that you can find that feels good so you don't know who your identity is in Jesus. And you've believed the lies of the devil. You've chased down drugs, alcohol, sex, power, money, authority. These things that you think are going to be the answer for you and society is telling you are, they're never going to be the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so tonight, you stand at a precipice of who are you going to be. Are you going to be like a world that's condemned itself to death? Or are you going to step into the light and become what God's called you to be? A child of a king bought with a price, covered in the blood, set free from the sin and the darkness of this world to be what God intended you to be. That's the message we would preach at Wired. We didn't sugarcoat nothing. And we would say, when you walk out those doors, if you don't make a decision tonight on who it is you're going to be and who you're going to serve, then you're going to march yourself right out of here and embrace the idea you're going to march into hell to an enemy that hates you and wants you to be in torment and pain. That's your choice and your decision, but you make it. 
You may sit here on Sunday and go, I don't know, Pastor Pat is mean. But after hearing that, you're like, oh, I guess it could be way worse. Then we would do altar calls, and guess what would happen? Well, God would move. Because here's what I've learned. You don't have to be a great orator. You don't have to be a great preacher. You just preach the gospel, and the Spirit moves, and people are affected. So you'd have a thousand rowdy goofball kids stand up, and then you'd be like, we're going to have altar call, and then like half the room would come down. And you got to watch you sponsors be like, what are we going to do? People need Jesus. So when Paul goes, when I went to the Jews, I acted like a Jew. When I went to the Gentiles, I acted like a Gentile. When I went to the weak, I acted like the weak. What he's saying is, I'm going to do whatever I have to do so that people know the weight of the gospel. The gospel is what defines Christian people. It defines pastors. It defines lay people. It's the motivation for why we do everything that we do. It's not money. It's not power. It's not accumulation. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you'll be willing, are you willing, to give up all of that so that somebody can know Jesus? That's what he's getting at with this. That's why pastors are bivocational. Everyone wants to talk about, oh, pastors are so rich. Most pastors I know work two jobs. They do two things to try to make ends meet because what's important to them is you don't want to be a burden on your church and you want to be able to support and take care of your family. But you, at the end of the day, you carry a weight on your shoulders if there's people who don't know who Jesus is and what he has for them and he's given me a gift and an ability to communicate that and so I'm going to do that. And if I get paid great, if I don't get paid great, if there's some place I can stand up with a microphone, I'm going to scream Jesus. That's ingrained into who I am. Paul ends it like this. Do you not know that in a race all runners run? But only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we are imperishable. So I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body, I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul loves sports, talks about them a lot. And he picks running here, uh, and he says, don't you know that uh, in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Implying that if it's a real race, everybody's running to win. So we're not talking about like the Boston Marathon where they say go, and like three people are actually trying to win the thing, and the rest are just like, hello everyone, hello I'm here for the t-shirt. Thank you. Thank you. He's talking about committed athletes. Pastor Nathan and I talk about this all the time. There are people who like sports, people who play sports, and then there are freaks of nature athletes. There are people who do things that don't make any sense. Kobe Bryant would practice basketball nine hours a day. And I'm not talking about he was in a gym for nine hours. I mean, like, he would get there beforehand, before practice was supposed to start, so he could have pre-practice. And he'd just shoot layups and free throws by himself. Because he figured out the amount of time that he spent in practice was incremental in how much better he would be everybody else. So if he could get more time in a practice situation, he would be better than them in their situation. That's, you're in a different place in your brain. Right? I've had athlete friends that are like, we can't play pickup sports because I'm so competitive that if I start to lose, I'll hurt somebody. Yeah, please don't play. That's what Paul is getting at. What Paul is saying, look, those guys exercise incredible self-control to be good at a sport that at the end of the day doesn't really matter. Right? Like most people can't tell you who won the Super Bowl five years ago. I mean, the, you know, the NFL dorks can. But most people in this room would be like, I have no idea. What's the NFL? But you have people with incredible dedication to accomplish that thing. So Paul is saying, look, if we believe what it is that we believe, if you really believe that every person across the board, man, woman, and child, is condemned to death, and there's no way to get out of that condemnation, that because of our sin and our inability to live as God wanted us to live, that we are lost to our own devices, if you really believe that, 
And then you believe that in God's love and in God's caring and in his plan and his sovereignty saw fit to send his son to die to rectify a situation that feels like it's unrectifiable. That he came into this world and overcame something that was not supposed to be overcome. You can't overcome death. How do you do that? Everybody dies. Nobody's done it since, right? There's, and there's not even a question. It's not like, is he the next one? I wonder if he'll be the guy to not die. No, we're all going to die. But Jesus overcame death. And then he said, anybody who comes unto me, I will set free from this burden. If you believe in me, I will make you like me. If you come to me, I will take your heavy burden, your broken life, and I will give you a new thing to bear, which is my cross, to go into the world and tell people, you don't have to be a slave to all of this garbage that you're a slave to. You don't have to worry about money. You don't have to worry about sex and power and control. You can just worry about me. So that other people know, like, hey, you can get off of this race any point you want, and then you can chase after the God who made you. So Paul says, I'm going to run my race, and I'm not going to shadow box. I'm not going to play games. I'm not going to pretend like what I'm doing is important. I'm going to preach the gospel day in and day out. When people say, I'm having a hard time, I'm going to say, you need Jesus. When people say, my marriage is falling apart, you need Jesus. When people say, I can't make my power bill, I don't know what I'm going to do, you need Jesus. When people say, I don't know how I can overcome my gender issues or my sexuality issues, you need Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. We're going to preach Jesus, we're going to scream Jesus, we're going to say Jesus, because the only thing that can save people is Jesus. And I don't care if you pay me, I don't care if you don't pay me, I'll go get another job and I'll keep screaming Jesus. Because at the end of the day, when I put my head on the pillow the last time, as an old man, fingers crossed, I'm fat, who knows. But when I do that, and I face the God who created me, I don't want there to ever be a moment where he goes, how come you didn't X? I want to be able to say I did everything I knew to do to tell people you don't have to be a slave to sin. Christ has died to redeem you. It doesn't matter what you were. It doesn't matter what you did. What matters is who you're going to be now. And who you are now is a bearer of the cross of Jesus Christ. You can take your former identity, you can put it in a box and put it on a shelf, and you can pick up his identity and become the thing he made you to be. Set free from the darkness of this world and a bearer of the light of him. And when you wander and you don't make that decision and you walk out of these doors and you can't figure out what it's going to be, that's what you're vacillating between. We're not talking about being religious. I'm not talking about showing up on Wednesday nights to Bible studies. I'm not talking about even your giving or your tithing. I'm talking about who you are in the eyes of the God who made you. And are you going to live in rebellion or are you going to submit your will and become what he wants you to be? Set free from death, empowered with the cross, filled with the Spirit so that you can go into the world and make a difference that matters eternally. Let's be that church. Lord, we come to you this morning. We lift up vintage to you. Lord, I pray for every person in this room. Lord, I pray first and foremost for those that are standing at that gap trying to figure out which way they're going to go. Lord, I pray that you would first and foremost help them to put aside all of their preconceived ideas about what it means to be your follower. Lord, I pray for a unique experience for them this morning, that you would reveal yourself to them for the first time that you would open their mind and open their heart to the revelation that you are real, that you do care, that you are here. Speak into people's hearts and into people's minds. Set them free from the bondage of the darkness the enemy keeps trying to hook to them. For believers in this room, Lord, I pray for our priorities. Help us to focus on the thing that matters, which is you. Lord, I pray against anxiety and stress and fear and worry. How are we going to make the ends meet? How are this and that? How are we going to get that accomplished? How am I going to be happy if I don't have this? Lord, just help us to make our focus on you and you alone. And then, Lord, I pray that you would empower us and fill us with your spirit, with a boldness to take your gospel and run this race in a way that says we want to win. We know winning in this race means conversions of people. We mean that the growth in numbers. We know that means people who come and are a part of what it is that we do. We know that winning a race that you've put in front of us means that we are training and teaching people to become your disciples. 
And so, Lord, I pray the only way that will ever happen is if you move through who we are and what it is that we do. Anoint our worship times, anoint our service times. Lord, I pray you would anoint every person's private time in this room as they seek you out on their own, as they study the word, as they pray and they communicate with you. Lord, I pray you would raise an army up in this room of people who are passionate about doing whatever it is you lay on their heart to do. Let us approach our daily life as what and how can I take Jesus to a world that doesn't know about him. Use us, Lord. It's in your gracious name we pray. Amen.